In this next video in our Crash Course Trigonometry series, I'm going to walk through the definitions of the inverse trigonometric functions. I want to talk briefly about inverse relationships in general, and the idea is that when we have a function y equals f of x, sometimes we want to reverse the relationship between y and x and think about the equation x equals f of y. Now we can always write the equation x equals f of y for any function f, but that doesn't always define y as a function of f. We can't always take that equation x equals f of y and solve it for y. When we can, we write y equals f inverse of x. So this equation here, we can't always do that, but when we do, that's just another way to write this same relationship where we have an inverse function. And the idea in this video is that we're going to try to do that for our trigonometric functions. So the idea here is that if we had y equals sine of x, that says that y is the sine of the angle represented by x. But if we reverse that and write x equals the sine of y, then the roles of x and y have been switched. So instead of x being the angle, now y is the angle, and x is the sine of that angle. And the question that we want to ask is, does that define a function? In other words, if we knew what the sine of our angle was, would that be able to tell us what the actual angle itself was? So if we have a value of x, can we determine the angle y whose sine is x? And unfortunately, that doesn't happen for the sine function. So what we have here on the left is the graph of y equals the sine of x. And then on the right, what we have is the reversed relationship, x equals the sine of y. And the problem here is that this x equals the sine of y is not a function. And the way that I know that it's not a function is that it fails the vertical line test. The vertical line test is something that we can use for the graph of an equation. And if that vertical line crosses my graph more than once, then the graph does not re represent a function. And in this case, x equals the sine of y is spectacularly not a function. This is going to, this vertical line is going to intersect my graph infinitely many times, not just more than once, but way worse than that, infinitely many times. So at this point, we might look at this and say, well, we tried x equals the sine of y. We thought that might work, but it's not a function, so we give up. But it turns out that we can't we can actually find a way forward. And what we do is we modify the sine function. Instead of letting our sine function run from x goes from negative infinity to positive infinity, what we do is we restrict the sine function. So this graph right here is what we call the restricted sine function. So it's the same old sine function, but what we've done is we've changed its domain. We've made the domain only go from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. And so when we do that and we reverse x and y, so this is still the graph of x equals the sine of y, but with that modified domain, now this dotted portion of my graph is not there. This dotted portion of my graph is not there. This much is a function. And that function that we got there is what we call the inverse sine function. So it's not quite the inverse of the original sine function. It's the inverse of the restricted sine function. So when we say y equals the inverse sine of x, and that's how we read this sine to the minus 1, we say y equals the inverse sine of x. So when we write that, what that means is not just that y is the angle whose sine is x, but y is the angle between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2 whose sine is equal to x. So when we evaluate an inverse sine function, the answer, the y value that we get out, is always between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. That's going to become important when we start using these inverse trig functions to solve equations. So the, the negative 1 notation, I've talked about that in a previous video. So remember that inverse sine of x here is not the same as sine of x to the negative 1, because this is cosecant of x. That's just 1 over the sine of x. So it is a little bit unfortunate that we use a negative 1 exponent here when that already kind of has a different meaning, but it's just something that we have to keep track of. Because of that confusing negative 1 notation, sometimes you'll see it written as arcsine, A-R-C-S-I-N. That's actually a better notation in my opinion, but it's much less common of a notation, so I'm going to continue to use the negative 1 exponent notation just because it's much more common. So let's look at an example. So let's evaluate the inverse sine of 1 half. So what does this mean? So the inverse sine of 1 half is the angle between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. Remember, that's part of our definition of inverse sine. 
whose sine is one half. And in this case, we know that we have a special angle whose sine is one half. We know that the sine of pi over six, 30 degrees, is one half, and that pi over six is between negative pi over two and pi over two. Check. So that means that our answer here is simply just pi over six. So when it's a special angle, that's not too bad. Now inverse cosine is defined in a very similar way, except instead of restricting the domain to be negative pi over two to pi over two, again, that wouldn't work if we went from negative pi over two to pi over two. When I flip the function over, my vertical line would still cross my graph more than once. So instead what we do is we make the domain go from, uh, from zero to pi. So that gives me a flipped over graph. So this is x equals the cosine of y. And when I've restricted my domain, that does give me a function. So again, when we write y equals the inverse cosine of x, this doesn't just mean that y is an angle whose cosine is x. It means specifically y is the angle between 0 and pi whose cosine is equal to x. So again, let's do an example. So we want to evaluate the inverse cosine of negative square root of 2 over 2. So again, let's think about what that means. So this is the angle between 0 and pi. So again, we have a slightly different definition here between 0 and pi whose cosine is minus the square root of 2 over 2. Now let's think about that minus for a second. You might think, well, gosh, I wish that minus wasn't there because I know, so we know that the cosine of pi over 4, 45 degrees, is positive the square root of 2 over 2. But we're looking for an angle whose cosine is minus the square root of 2 over 2. So how do we deal with that minus sign? Well, what we're going to do is think about reference angles, because what this tells us is that the reference angle for the angle that we're looking for is pi over 4. Pi over 4 is an acute angle. It's 45 degrees between 0 and 90. And so the angle that we're looking for has to have pi over 4 as its reference angle. So we know a lot about this angle that we're looking for. We know it's between 0 and pi, which means we know that it's somewhere here in the top half of our unit circle, because here's 0 and pi is over here. And so we also know that the reference angle is pi over 4. There are only two angles that fit that criteria. Pi over 4, which we know is not the right answer because the cosine of pi over 4 is positive the square root of 2, and whatever this angle is over here in quadrant 2. Well, we know the reference angle for that mysterious angle has to be pi over 4. So what angle in quadrant two has reference angle pi over four, well, that's gonna be pi, which is the full half turn, minus pi over four, which works out to be three pi over four. So we're sort of doing a little bit of detective work, right? We kind of narrowing down the possibilities, looking at reference angles, but after a little bit of effort, we can figure out that the result we're looking for here is three pi over four. Now the inverse tangent function is defined pretty similarly, uh, very similar to inverse sine. We're going to restrict our domain to go from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Slight difference here because negative pi over 2 and pi over 2 themselves are not actually in the domain of tangent. Those are places where I have vertical asymptotes. So the domain is actually the open interval from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. It does not include those angles. And then when I flip the function over, those vertical asymptotes become horizontal asymptotes. So that's a feature of the inverse tangent function, that it has these horizontal asymptotes. So again, when we write y equals the inverse tangent of x, again, that does not mean that y is just any angle whose tangent is x. y is specifically the angle that lies between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, whose tangent is equal to x. So we've got three more trig functions that we might want to find inverses of, inverse cotangent, secant, and cosecant. We can do pretty much the same process for inverting these. I'm going to leave those details out here just because inverse sine, inverse cosine, and inverse tangent are really the most common ones that you'll see, um, and those are the ones you have buttons for on your calculator and so on. So those are the ones that we're going to focus on in this series. So what did we do in this video? We talked about the definitions of inverse sine, inverse cosine, and inverse tangent, talked about restricting domains so that those functions would actually be invertible. And next time we're going to use these inverse trigonometric functions to solve trigonometric equations. See you then.